I mean, first of all, how would you characterize, you know, if God came down and said, justify what you're doing right now, what contribution are you making to, to the world? What would you say? <laughs> okay, so <laughs> I, I'm, I'm resisting the temptation to be self-aggrandizing right now. And uh, God might smite you for that. So that's probably <laughs> wise. Characterize my enterprise as, you know, at some uh, level of uh, saving civilization or something like that. Um, I'm in a sustained argument with the zeitgeist about the nature of the country in relation to the unresolved issues of uh, race, racial domination and subordination, inequality, exclusion. Uh, discrimination and so on. Um, and it's not the only thing I'm doing by any means, but it's the main, it seems to me, it's the main crux of the matter. I, I think the discourse is off the rails, badly, historically wrongheaded, and uh, feel that I, have something to say about that. Uh, not necessarily, I say my mouth is no prayer book, you know, not like I've, you know, got the answer or something like that, but that I've, I've got some something to say. And I feel like I'm playing this role of the gadfly of, of, of the person stepping out from the consensus. I know, as I say, it sounds self-aggrandizing. That's why I hesitated to go down this road in the first place. But um, uniquely situated to be able to articulate certain lines of concern that otherwise might not be effectively communicated. So something like that. So I'm, I'm trying to make that kind of contrarian uh, outside of the, of the box. Uh, intervention in the national conversation about justice and uh, racial equity. And when you say the conversation has gone off the rails, how would you characterize the problem in kind of the most generic way possible, if that makes sense, or at the highest level of abstraction or something? So here's a stab at that. Um, I've put this in some things that I've written uh, for popular venues, like in the City Journal and lectures that I've given, I say you have two narratives that conflict with each other, the bias narrative and the development narrative. And the bias narrative is white supremacy has done us wrong. America has its knee on the neck. Uh, black uh, exclusion, discrimination, uh, and, and so on. Historical injustice, mass incarceration is in effect a conspiracy to confine black people. I mean, that puts it a little bit too sharply, but is ipso facto, et cetera, a um, manifestation of an age old story. George Floyd dying in Minneapolis is, but the 21st century extension of Emmett Till being killed uh, in the South in the 1950s, bias, white supremacy, uh, uh, racial domination, racial exclusion, the bias narrative. I want to contrast that with the development narrative in which I put center place the incomplete project of empowering African Americans who had been, have been impacted adversely by history to acquiring the capacities of function and performance that allow for effective competition in a world that is basically a level playing field. Of course, it's not completely and perfectly a level playing field, but that the question should be, if I take incarceration as the case in point, I've got kids, young adults, behaving in ways that are socially disruptive, manifesting in that behavior, the incomplete process of their own socialization and human development, acting out in ways that are destructive, one can certainly give accounts of how it is that they and a community full of people like them might have come 
to be in the situation that, that they are. But the first order imperative is at the acquisition of skills, the acculturation of patterns of behavior, the redress of the uh, background social conditions that led to this dysfunction, uh, the, the redress of those developmental deficits manifested in their behavior, which led to them being incarcerated. These are two radically different ways of looking at the problem of overrepresentation of African Americans amongst those who are incarcerated, which I give as only one example of this larger okay. of this larger phenomenon. Where you see gaps, disparity, and deficits, your story about them can either be the system is so rigged as to exclude, or it can be, and of course these are not mutually exclusive. I, I use this only to characterize the terrain in the stark way that you asked me to do. Um, exclusion and discrimination and bias or performance and behavior and development. And I'm saying the latter. So you, you take something like affirmative action. Now, you know, there's a whole big legal argument about it, but get down to the basics of it. African-American kids presenting test scores that are low relative to the test scores being presented by others who would like to get into this exclusive uh, line of the school or whatever. Now, there is racism, there is, uh, uh, you know, implicit bias, there are, there are all kinds of, uh, uh, you know, imperfections and whatnot. But if you have a persistent phenomenon of substantial quantitative disparities and the measured performance on intellectual work by race, your solution to that can't be changing the standards so as to accommodate the difference and still get the numbers right. That's not justice. That's not uh, equality. That, that's a corrupt, uh, cowardly avoidance of a historic challenge of actually acknowledging, reckoning with, and redressing the performance differences that are reflected uh, in these tests. The reflex to get rid of the instrument of assessment because it reports to us the objective fact of racial disparities in performance must be resisted. It infantilizes the people on behalf of whom it's been undertaken. It's the easy way out for the institutions that purport to ad, uh, advocate for, for justice and fairness, but that in fact simply want not to acknowledge the problem and et cetera. So I could go on in this vein for a long time, but okay. you, see, you see the distinction that I'm making. So yeah. So uh, that's my, that's the, at least that's one of my, uh, I mean, I, there are other points, but that's one of my, my, my central points where I feel like I've got my finger on something important uh, that uh, the, the zeitgeist has got wrong. Okay. Um, so you, you think in a certain sense, buying into the bias narrative is unhealthy for the people that uh, supposedly, um, the 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 people advancing the bias narrative are trying to help, uh, and that 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 could, in principle, be the case, even if there's a lot of validity to the bias narrative. Right? That could be the case. You're also saying that you wonder how much validity there is, at least in the sense that you think we've got a pretty pretty fair playing field. Uh, but at the same time, it could be that we could have a one that's more unfair than you believe to be the case. And it could still be the case that the bias narrative is just an unhealthy thing to walk around with, right? That's in principle possible. Yeah, that's in principle possible. Let me let me um let me ask you about the the conversation itself. Uh, I mean, we are said to be, and I think we are in a time when it is hard to communicate effectively with people who disagree with you about important issues. Right. That's a, the, you know, the polarization, the tribalism, whatever you want to call it. Uh, how. How happy are you with. The, the way your message is or is not resonating and who it is or isn't resonating with. I'm almost completely in despair <laughs> about it, Bob, to be completely honest with you. I mean, uh, 
again, I have to acknowledge in advance that anything I say here is bound to seem to be uh, self-promoting or self-aggrandizing uh, uh, in some way or another. The intensity of vilification and the ferocity of people's uh, reaction who don't like what I'm saying unsettles me. I, I mean, it, it's not just that Twitter has mobs. Twitter has mobs. I know that Twitter has mobs. Uh, or that there are people in the comment section who are trolls. I, I know that that's the case. But, but um, you know, I don't take too kindly to being called a hack, Bob. <laughs> I mean, you're, you're not you alone. Know, I, I'm a fellow of the Econometric Society. I'm a distinguished fellow of the American Economics Association. I've published an econometric of the American Economic Review, the Journal of Political Economy, the Quarterly Journal of Economics, the Review of Economic Studies, the Journal of Labor Economics. There are Wikipedia articles about research papers that I have written. Some of my papers have thousands of citations. I'll stop, okay? Yeah, we don't, want God, we don't want God to smite you. We don't want there's God no, to smite there's you. There's no way that I'm a hack, okay? There's no way that I'm <laughs> we a can hack. Rule. I'm willing to stipulate that you're not a hack. Let's, rule, let's take that possibility off the table. Well, Moreover, I, I mean, and I'll just go on in this vein for just a moment to try to make the point. You've asked me how I am experiencing the discourse, and I say it sometimes drives me to despair. And one of the things that causes me that is the vitriolic way in which I am received by people who simply have a different opinion than me about affirmative action or whatever. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, um, the, yeah. Well, I was just going to say there probably are people who have been criticized by you and or John McWhorter on your show, who feel, the same who way. feel that you have uh, sometimes yeah. uh, spoken about them in, let's say, an animated tone. OK, now, <laughs> uh, fair enough. Perhaps I draw some of this vitriol by the way in which my rants veer off into a vitriolic dismissal of certain people with three names who I don't have to name here, whom I've called empty suits and lightweights and so forth and so on. So, okay, fair enough. Uh, maybe I'm uh, maybe I'm poisoning the well a little bit and I, I do take responsibility for losing it sometimes. Okay, I'm sorry, I, I apologize. Uh, but, but so, there is but that, but that, let me just finish the point. Yeah. Because a similar disquiet sometimes overtakes me when I read uh, affirmations and celebrations of what I've said huh. by, by people who comment in effect, thank God there's some sensible black people in this country who see the world the way I see it. Some of these people are Donald Trump supporters, unavowedly so, I mean, avowedly so, uh, who say in effect, yeah, finally somebody gets it right, who, who um, in effect take comfort from the critical line that I'm taking on behalf of positions uh, I'll just mention one, racial realism. These are the people who think there are essential differences between the racial populations that account for contemporary socioeconomic disparities in a one-to-one -one or direct way. Uh, and they say, well, why don't you just take the next step, Lowry? You're almost there. You're almost there. And that is also unsettling, especially as I realize that part of the vitriol coming from the people who reject what I say is motivated by an observation about the warm glow feeling that I seem to give to some people who like what I'm mm -hmm. saying. Mm -hmm. See what I'm saying. No, it's uh, it's hard. I mean, life on the Internet is hard. I mean, if you have a, a platform of any prominence, people, unless you're super boring, there are going to be people saying horrible things about you. But you've definitely gotten more than your share. And, and although I did, although I did suggest that, you know, viewed. Uh, from the other side, you might look like part of the problem. There is an asymmetry, a genuine asymmetry that I believe is the case here, which is that I think you are willing to have a discussion slash debate with any of the people you're criticizing. And few of them are willing to have one with you so far as I can tell. Is that not the case? That's the case, Robert. Thank you for noticing that. And I would just go one step further on this campaign of self-aggrandizement. I'm also capable of articulating in detail exactly what they believe, even as I reject it. Hmm. And they would not be able to know how to begin to give a coherent and nuanced account of what it is that I'm on behalf of. 
they, their representations of me are all stick figured and uh, sloganeering and you know, mm -hmm. platitude, something like that.